Phase diagram is going to be the topic in this second lesson in a chapter on solids and liquids. And uh, in this case, we're going to take a look at graphs of pressure versus temperature and some of the unique characteristics of these graphs uh, for a few different substances. Uh, and we're going to look at some special vocabulary associated with different regions or points on these different phase diagrams. All right, so when we take a look at these phase diagrams here, so again, it's a plot of pressure versus temperature, and we're going to look at what it looks like for a typical substance, and then we'll take a look and compare that and contrast that to a couple of unique substances, one in carbon dioxide and one in water. And you definitely got to be familiar with what a typical substance's phase diagram looks like, but then also how CO2 and water differ from that typical substance. All right, so here's your typical substance, and I've kind of marked where one atmosphere lies and stuff like this. So, but it turns out that these lines here separate the three different phases. So we've got the, let's get this in blue. We've got the solid phase over here, and then the liquid phase over here, and then the gas phase down below the curve here. So these are the three different regions. And if you kind of look at where one atmosphere lies and kind of dra drag a line all the way across, you'll see that as you increase the temperature at one atmosphere, you'll go from the solid phase to the liquid phase to the gas phase. So just like we typically accept, uh, expect from most substances, so from solid to liquid, they melt, and from liquid to gas, they boil, and so on and so forth. So, well, it turns out again, one atmosphere, the pressure at sea level. So we define some points here. So when you cross from solid to liquid, and again, you melt, well, if it happens at one atmosphere, we call it the normal melting point. I'll abbreviate that normal MP here for normal melting point. And again, if you go from liquid to gas, then you're boiling a substance. And if again, that happens at one atmosphere, then that specific point is called the normal boiling point, abbreviated BP here for boiling point. Cool. If it happens at any other pressure, it can still be a melting point and a boiling point, but it's not going to be the normal melting point or boiling point. So it turns out your melting point and boiling points are totally pressure dependent. So like when we give you the you know melting point of water is zero degrees Celsius and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, well, that's true as long as you're at one atmosphere. But if you're at any other pressure, well, those, those points are going to change, it turns out. All right. So... It turns out when you are on one of these lines, you're at the phase train, uh, phase change, tra uh, phase transition temperature or phase change temperature. So you actually have two phases in equilibrium together. So in this case, anywhere along this line, you have the solid and liquid phase together. And if you're uh, again right at the melting temperature, then you have solid and liquid in equilibrium together. So cool. As a result, we call these lines the lines of equilibrium. This is the solid liquid line of equilibrium, the liquid gas line of equilibrium, and the solid gas line of equilibrium. And if you lie anywhere on that line, you're going to have two phases in equilibrium together, except for this lovely point right here, where all the lines meet. And it's at that one point and that one point alone where solid, liquid, and gas are all in equilibrium together. And so as a result, this gets a special name, that unique point right there. And it's called the triple point. So only point where you have all three phases in equilibrium together. And, you know, uh, it might randomly occur, you know, at a pressure of one atmosphere for some substances. But, for, you know, for a typical substance, it's probably not going to happen at one atmosphere. You have to be at the exact pressure and exact temperature unique to that substance to have that triple point occur. All right. So got to know your lines of equilibrium, got to know that triple point as well. So you should also be able to identify any of your six phase changes. So if I showed you this line right here, what phase change does that represent? Well, you'd be like, well, that's solid to liquid. And they might not even have solid, liquid, and gas labeled on here. You'd have to recognize where they show up. But that line would represent either melting or fusion, as you might recall. Well, what if I gave you the exact opposite line instead and going from liquid to solid? You might recall that as freezing or crystal is the name of that phase change. So cool. So be able to identify all six of your phase changes there. So what about liquid to gas? So if I gave you, you know, your liquid turning into gas there, you'd know that as boiling or vaporization, you might recall. So and if we kind of switch it the other way around from gas to liquid, that's going to be condensation. And then finally, the ones you're most likely to forget, which is why we love to test you on them. So if I go from solid to gas, that is sublimation. And if we flip that around, and go from gas to solid, that is deposition or vapor deposition. So deposit that in your head. So you might need to identify all the lovely phase changes on a, a phase diagram like this. So, and then there's one more point way out here. Let's identify that with a little better looking arrow. So, and this is called the critical point. 
and it has a critical pressure and a critical temperature associated with it, collectively just called the critical point. And this critical point is going to be different for different substances. So, but, so what it is is a little bit complicated. So if we talk about what it is, um, kind of got to give an example here. So let's, let's, you know, let's erase some of these things so we can have a little room to talk about this. So let's take a look at that critical point here. We're going to kind of take a look at a hypothetical situation to demonstrate what that is. And let's just say that you have a gas right here. So, and you want to turn that gas into a liquid. Well, how do you pull that off? Well, you've got a couple of different ways, right? So if you want to turn it into a liquid, you can either raise the pressure and cross the uh, liquid gas line of equilibrium going up, or you could lower the temperature and cross the liquid gas line of equilibrium going back to the left. So either one of those is going to work. Well, in this case, I'm going to consider increasing the pressure. So now nah, let's go, let's decrease the temperature instead. So as we decrease the temperature, so as soon as you cross that line of equilibrium, it turns into a liquid. So, and a, a characteristic, you know, key thing occurs right as you cross that line of equilibrium that it's very noticeable. So when that gas turns into a liquid, all of a sudden it condenses. In the gas phase, it takes up a huge volume. In the liquid phase, much, much, much smaller volume. You know, under typical conditions, a, a gas would occupy somewhere on the order of like a thousand to ten thousand times more volume than the corresponding liquid. And so when it goes from gas to liquid, when it condenses, you get a big reduction in volume. And so what does this look like? So well, it looks, it's very noticeable, let's say. So we used to uh, talk of a professor who would take a big 55 gallon drum and long before any of the students showed up for class, he'd fill it full of superheated steam. So, and then he'd seal the thing and then put it off in the corner and, uh, and there it is, full of superheated steam and sealed, again, is key as well. So students would file in the room and he'd start lecturing. So, well, the whole time, the superheated steam inside this 55 gallon drum is going down in temperature, so because of the cooler room around it. And once its temperature would hit 100 degrees Celsius, all of a sudden that would turn into a liquid. That steam turns into a liquid and go from occupying the full volume of that 55 gallon drum to occupying a much smaller volume. And as a result, it would create a vacuum in that lovely 55 gallon drum, and that's a very noticeable situation. It would look like boom! The whole thing would just implode, not explode, but it would implode making a ginormous noise, scaring the crap out of everybody, but being a great demonstration of exactly this concept of condensation. But it's really noticeable is the key here when you cross that line of equilibrium. Well, let's say we do the same thing here, but we're going to take a little bit different path. So instead of cooling it down, we're going to heat this gas up. So after we've heated it up, we are going to jack up the pressure. So after we've jacked up the pressure, we're now going to lower the temperature. And now that we've lowered the temperature, we're going to lower the pressure back down and end up at exactly the same place at the end of the condensation we just did. The question I have for you, though, is when did this gas turn into a liquid? gas line of equilibrium. There wasn't just a single point where we had this big mega change in volume, in this case a reduction in volume, like we did in the last example when we did cross the line. And that's what the critical point actually is. It is the temperature beyond which there is no liquid gas line of equilibrium. There's no liquid gas phase transition, we say. And so the idea is that, you know, typically if you jack up the pressure on a gas, you force the molecules closer and closer together. And at some point you'll force them close enough that they won't be able to, you know, they won't be able to overcome the intermolecular attraction between them and all the molecules will just stick to each other, forming a liquid, condensing into a liquid. So, but once you're beyond this point at this really high temperature, beyond that critical temperature, you, those molecules have so much kinetic energy at that high temperature that it doesn't matter how much pressure you put on it, they're not going to just simply collapse into a liquid. They'll just get closer and closer and closer and closer. Whereas normally, if you just, you know, have a gas at this point right here, below the critical temperature, as you jack up the pressure, they get closer, they get closer, and then they would collapse into a liquid right as you hit the line of equilibrium. That doesn't happen out here beyond that critical temperature. And so it's just the temperature above which there is no liquid gas phase transition. It turns out if you're out in this region out here, you're not a liquid or a gas, it turns out. You're what we often call a super critical fluid. 
So super critical just means above the critical point fluid, if you will. So, so anywhere out here, you're a super critical fluid. You're not in the phase, you're not in the gas phase, you're beyond that critical point. Cool. So that's what you should understand the critical point to mean. So, and you should know what it means. Again, the point above which there's no liquid gas phase transition. And you should also be able to identify it. It's at the very end of the liquid gas line of equilibrium. Cool. If you notice, there's no corresponding point on the solid liquid line of equilibrium. So this just goes all the way to the top of the graph. It doesn't stop at any particular point. So, and probably not the most important thing for high school, but I'll mention it briefly. So typically the higher the intermolecular forces for a substance and the higher this critical temperature is going to be the further to the right on the graph. All right. So there's all of our lovely points. You should know where solid, liquid, and gas lie. You should know where the triple point is, where the critical point is. You should know these are called lines of equilibrium. And then you should know where the normal melting point and normal boiling point lie. So how in the world is carbon dioxide different? Because these graphs look remarkably similar. And they are. We still have solid, liquid, gas. So, but you might know that carbon dioxide, when you freeze it, if you will, and freezing is really a bad word here, it turns out. So, but frozen carbon dioxide, we'll call it that solid carbon dioxide, it's called dry ice. And it's called dry ice for a reason, because liquid carbon dioxide doesn't exist at one atmosphere. And so if you have some dry ice here at one atmosphere, just at kind of normal conditions at sea level, and you heat it up, it never turns into the liquid phase. It goes straight from solid to gas and it sublimes. And not a lot of substances actually sublime at you know, atmospheric pressure. So this is kind of unique for carbon dioxide. It's just where one atmosphere lies. One atmosphere is below the triple point, whereas for most compounds, one atmosphere is actually above the triple point. And when that's the case though, when your one atmosphere is below that triple point, then liquid carbon dioxide doesn't exist at one atmosphere. And this compound's going to sublime rather than go through the normal melting and then boiling and so on and so forth. Cool. So that's what's unique about carbon dioxide. If you want liquid carbon dioxide, only going to exist at elevated pressures. So, all right. So if we take a look at water, on the other hand, what makes water unique is not where one atmosphere lies. So we've still got solid, liquid, and gas. If we take a look at where one atmosphere is, so it's right here and it's above the triple point. And so water, as you already know, it melts above zero degrees Celsius at one atmosphere and it boils above hundred degrees Celsius at one atmosphere. Things of this sort doesn't sublime under normal uh, atmospheric pressure or anything like that. What's unique though, is this solid liquid line of equilibrium. For a typical compound and for carbon dioxide, it has an uphill slope, what we call a positive mathematical slope, right? So uphill, but for water, it is a downhill slope. And so, and this is rather unique for water. This is rather unusual and it is due to hydrogen bonding. So cool. So everything unusual about water, almost without exception, is due to hydrogen bonding at the end of the day. So if you look what's going on here, well, water has the unusual property that when you freeze it, it expands. So for most substances, that is not the case at all. So typically the solid is the most dense phase, then the liquid, and then the gas is the least dense. And so the gas takes up the most volume, the solid takes up the least volume. But for water, the liquid actually takes up less volume than the solid. And that is unique. And again, it comes down to that pattern of hydrogen bonding that occurs only if the molecules spread out when you freeze it. And so when you freeze water into a crystal and a crystal and ice, it adopts that exact expanded structure it needs to maximize the number of hydrogen bonds present in the structure. So it can't do it in the liquid phase, but when you freeze it in the solid phase, it expands just a little to accommodate that structure. So that's kind of the deal there due to hydrogen bonding. And so what you'll find is that as you jack up the pressure on something, as you're pushing in on a substance, it wants to get more and more compact. It wants to get more and more dense. And for a typical substance, if you take the solid phase and you jack up the pressure, it just stays a solid. It gets a more condensed solid. It gets more compact, but it's still a solid. So, but if you do the same thing with water here and you jack up the pressure, you actually cross a phase transition. You cross that solid liquid line of equilibrium and the solid turns into a liquid. The ice actually melts. And so at high pressures, ice melts. And this is a beautiful thing. And it's a beautiful thing for a couple different reasons. So one, so all of life kind of depends on this. So, cause when I, you know, like when a river freezes or when the oceans freeze, so the ice that forms 
floats to the top. And that's super important because it actually insulates the rest of the ocean or the rest of the river, the rest of the sea, whatever it is, the lake. So it insulates the rest of it from the cold water around so that it might actually stay liquid and everything alive in there might stay alive. So kind of important if you think about it. So if everything in the oceans died on an annual basis, um, that I don't know what you'd do the following year for life in the oceans and stuff. It'd be kind of a major problem. So, so kind of a big deal. But the even bigger issue is that ice hockey would not be near as fun if this were not the case. So because as you skate, notice skates have a nice narrow blade. And as you're skating on ice or as a hockey player is skating on ice, it applies a significant amount of pressure right below his blade. You might recall that pressure is force per area. So the hockey player's full weight applies a force to the ice below him. And it's why we have a very small surface area for a blade. That way a high force and a small area leads to a higher pressure. And right below that hockey player's skate, the ice actually melts. And this is important because if you wanna be, you know, have ice be more slippery, you wanna put it, a little water on it and have it be wet ice. Wet ice is more slippery than ice that is not wet. And so the idea is that when you skate, it actually makes the ice right under your skate a little bit wet. And so instead of using the term slippery, I'm gonna use the term friction. It actually reduces the amount of friction between your skate and the ice, and you can skate faster as a result because there's less friction between your skate and the ice. And so if this wasn't the case for water, you couldn't skate as fast and ice hockey would not be as fun. I, I always thought it'd kind of be a good prank to pull on a professional hockey team to replace the ice in their ice rink with dry ice instead. So because as they're skating and the pressure on the dry ice right underneath their skate goes up, it's not going to melt. It's just going to stay solid. And as a result, they're not going to skate as fast as they're used to skating. So it might be like, I'm going to check you. I'm coming. I'm going to check you. I'm still coming. I'm still coming. So it's just going to not be as exciting to watch hockey at that point. And that's more important than all life dying, like on an annual basis and stuff. So thought it'd be funny. So if we did play this practical joke on a professional hockey team, that would be hilarious until some of the carbon dioxide started, you know, subliming. And then they might like have some breathing problems. But up until that point, it might be funny. Cool. So that's unique about water, again, is that negative slope on that solid liquid line of equilibrium, which again, we attribute to hydrogen bonding. And this is indicative of the fact that again, the liquid is actually more dense than the solid. So again, when water freezes, it expands for almost any other substance you can think of. When that liquid phase freezes, it actually gets more compact. Not so the case with water. Know the phase diagram, what it looks like for a typical substance, know how carbon dioxide and water are both different, and once again, be able to identify all the lovely different points and the phase changes on a phase diagram. If you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? And if you have not found this lesson helpful, please still give me a like and a share. Nothing irritates me more than to see a bunch of people liking my stuff. So if you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.